Hello and welcome to uh, part two of my interview with Michael Seglia, incredible bass player who's had an illustrious career. Now, some of you may have seen this interview, seen, sorry, seen, seen Mike before because I got in touch with him about um, the fact that he played on Herman Zabel's incredible album. And that video is there. It's in the link there down below if you want to check out that one. And we'll be touching on that again. But when I spoke to Mike um, last time, I was aware of his incredible career in music. So I wanted to come back and talk to you about that, Mikey, if that's okay. I'd love to. And good to see you. And Happy New Year, even though it's a couple of days away. Yeah, Happy New Year to you. And you're, you're, you know, you were just telling me before we started, you're very busy at the moment. Yeah, I've been, I've been fortunate. You know, I'm, uh, you know, being a, a born and bred New Yorker and, and reaching a certain level of skill set, you know, people still um surprisingly want to play with me and i love it you know what have you been doing over the christmas holidays you haven't been sitting there eating mince pies and you know turkey no no i don't have time for mince pies i i didn't have time we i was actually doing um four shows with uh suzanne vega who is uh you know my longtime musical um compatriot and uh we had a, a wonderful time playing at a venue in new york called the city winery and um yeah, we did four nights there. We took off um, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, went back and did the last two nights. And I just finished that run last night. So uh, that was wonderful. You know, sold out shows, lovely, lovely so music. Ha so how long have you had this association with Susan Vega? I started playing with her in 1985, right when her first album came out. So I saw the whole rise uh, to, you know, virtual you know, on the on the cusp of superstardom at least, and then uh, you know the decline to a level that she's at right now, where she can go pretty much out and play anywhere in the world, and 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 you know she it, built, it, it was a up. colossal success. I mean, she it was, was really here in the success. UK, and it broke in, and it broke in England. I mean, it didn't break in America; it broke in England. Yeah, because I, I, you know, I can remember when you look into it the the. Luca being the huge single that charted in every country in the world, but I I believe she had a hit here before, off the first album. I think it was one of the first hits she had. I know that, uh, and I think the album charted um, really well. Yeah, as well. it did really well. And the first the first song that did that did break her open over there, and then cut consequently in Europe was Marlena on the Wall. That's the one. A br brilliant song. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to try is you know, so people are watching this channel, obviously. You're you're full on muso. You you came up, you know, playing with Herman Zabel. You played heavy prog, heavy fusion, heavy jazz, and here you are ending up playing with Suzanne Vega. And this is one of these esoteric facts that I think the general public don't know is that if you go to any band that that you know competent band with a with a with a great artist, those mm -hmm. musicians we all we all come back to a certain place don't we musically we all we all refer back to certain things and i find that very interesting so i, I want to explore that with you so um how and when did you start playing the bass um it was it was actually a very um a very kind of funny coincidence how i started playing the bass my father was a i was born in the east village of new york my father was a saxophone player up until the point where he decided to get married and have a family. And then he was like, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to do this as a profession anymore. So he switched over and then got a business degree. And, and But he always played, always still always played. So me being the firstborn and the first son, I was kind of his vicarious vessel to uh, explore music and, 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 and potentially become a professional. So right from the very early, right, very early age, I was exposed to fabulous music and he was mainly interested in uh in jazz his whole life so you know from the age of what, three years old i was listening to you know sarah vaughn and and uh, stan kenton and you know duke ellington and you know great billy holiday you know great jazz uh, yeah, my my dad was a huge kenton fan and uh, my mom her family was a huge kenton fan and they had a cat called kenton Oh my God, they were really into it. Oh God. yeah, but the I think the thing with Stan Kenton when you get into it because he was incredibly popular with yeah. really heavy music. But when you get into it, I think there's something happened with him in the seventies. There's a there's um 
and he seems to have been taken out of the picture. I don't, I don't, I don't know whether it was sort of sort of child abusey type stuff or. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Anything. Yeah, I'm, 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 it's really, it's a really interesting character, Stan Kent, oh, because it's, it, because the people of a certain age. Yeah. I, I grew up listening to that. So there, so there we have it. The jazz is there right at the start, isn't it? Jazz is there right at the start, and um, you know, when I was. I, I started like messing around with a, a piano at the age of 10 and then took a look, couple of clarinet lessons, but I was very drawn to the guitar and specifically the sound. Interestingly enough, when I was like um, 11, 12 years old, it was uh, s s very uh, much the sound of the nylon string classical guitar because my father had a very extensive record collection. So he would play me flamenco guitar and bossa nova guitar mm -hmm. and i was like that's a, that's a beautiful sound i want to do something like that so he found actually found me a classical guitar teacher um and i took um you know maybe a year's worth of lessons which was very good in a lot of ways you know to start me reading music and it also got my right hand in in the position to when i when i did switch over to bass my right hand was actually um was was in pretty good shape already from having to play the classical guitar the way it's played um but the way uh the reason that i i picked up the bass was very very funny um we were living in new jersey at the time uh, which is just across the river from new york city and we had a house and the house had a, a double car garage so it was a fairly large space and my sister who was like um 11 months younger than me befriended the local hotshot rock and roll, but teenage rock and roll combo band. And they were all two and three years older than yeah. me, which is when you're 11, that's a big difference. You know, 11 to 14, you know, puberty, everything is going on. Yeah. So, so um, my father being like the, 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 the crazy cool dad that he was allowed this band um, who we didn't know we weren't related to at all to rehearse in our mm -hmm. garage because he was just that way. He wanted to expose us all to music and be supportive and, you know, show us how to be generous and all of that, which he did. And uh, so they're rehearsing in our band and I'm upstairs, like, you know, trying to play a little bit of classical guitar or something. And, uh, and then one day, one day they had an argument with their bass player and the bass player kind of walked out in a huff during the rehearsal and um a light bulb went off in my father's on my father's head and he said to them he said hey i have an idea and if you guys want to keep rehearsing in in my garage you're going to have to audition my son on bass which i've never played before I... never so he he threw me into the car we went to the local music store he bought me like a 60 dollar bass that was hanging in the window and because I had been playing a little bit of guitar and, and had a very good ear, um, you know, I got the bass back to the house and, and they said, and these, these kids in the band said, well, can you play this? And they, you know, they, they, they played something. And then um, I, I think I went inside and uh, upstairs and listened to the record of uh, the, cause it was all cover music from the sixties, you know? And uh, I listened to the record and I started picking out the notes and then I came back and I said, yeah, I think I could play that. And I picked out the notes on the bass and, and they said, OK, great, you're in the band. <laughs> and that's how it all started. That was that was the beginning of it. And it, it's so funny how careers are made on these, you know, some guy having an argument. <laughs> and yeah, it could be anything. yeah. It, it, that's well, that's how it that's how it all started. And I, have, I haven't looked back in all of these years. It's been. Now I've been playing the bass for uh, for fifty six years or something like that. It's, it's a lot of time. So how did you move from you know playing the bass of that band to you know developing a career? Now what was your first gig? You know how you know I suppose yeah. New York was a great place to be. Well, fortunately, when when uh, I had a, a, the the timing and the geography was perfect because when I was. Um, when I was uh, 15, I was born in the East Village. I lived there for five years with my family. Then we moved to New Jersey for 10 years, which was suburbia. Mm. And then when I was fit and then I started playing out there, like I just said. And then when I was 15, we moved back to New York City. 
So I was already like music crazed and ready to go. And I just started, you know, New York being what it is, you just start meeting, um, you know, other friends and schoolmates that play and, you know, that play and let's have a band. And, you know, it became like more of a, more of the how I spent my 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 free time just by playing with with different people. And I was getting better and better, you know, and they were, you know, not getting better and better, but I was getting better and better. And fortunately, what happened was I um in the neighborhood I was living in. At the time, there were two uh, two brothers that became very, very iconic guitar players in, in the world. And they were the Kulik brothers, Bob Kulik and his younger brother, Bruce. And Bob actually came, was, was, during this time, was actually coming over to England and playing with like Long John Baldry and people like that. And his younger brother, Bruce, I happened to start a band with, and it was another cover band, but it was a very, very high level co cover band because all the musicians were really good. So that was a reasonably successful full, um, yeah, not full time weekend band. And we would play in the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and, and play all the clubs. And because of that association with Bruce and meeting and meeting Bob, Bob came to me one day when I was 22 and said, hey, I'm playing with this artist named John Cale and he's looking for a bass player. Would you be interested in it? And the only thing I, I didn't know much about John at that time, but I did know he was in the Velvet Underground with Lou Reed and and all of that. So I was like, this could be my first, you know, we're, we're going to go tour in Europe. And, and I was 22 and I was like, yeah, of course I want to do that. So, um, so I went and auditioned and I got the, I got the gigs. And so my first professional touring, uh, gig was, um, with John Cale. I was 22 and we, we, we flew to Europe and played gigs and festivals and concerts. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this is everything I wanted. I wanted to have to start happening, you know? Well, what were, you know, coming up through this time, who were your influences in music wise and bass wise? Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, I was unlike a lot of my my friends at the time, I was fascinated with the British music scene. I was all about it. So, I mean, it started with Jack Bruce, of course. And and then I, you know, I was all in on the on sort of the prog rock stuff, you know, every, everything. Yes, everything. Genesis, everything. King Crimson, Gentle Giant, Soft Machine, you know, I just kept going down, down, down all these rabbit holes. And those, those were my, interestingly enough, were my biggest influences. So I would be there, you know, this is, of course, pre-digital and you're there with all these records and you're just needle dropping to figure out what the bass player was playing. And, you know, I just started picking up things and, you know, and getting more adventurous in my playing as, uh, because those players, um, kind of transformed the bass from a background instrument to more of a foreground instrument. You but know, who were your bass yeah. heroes at that time? What's that? Sorry, who were your bass heroes? Oh yeah, well, I mean, it was Jack Bruce, it was Chris Squire, it was uh, John Entwistle, John Paul Jones. You know, all the British guys that that I loved so much, um, and uh, I was I was all about that. Yeah. And what about the sort of um, Stanley Clarks and the Mavish Norkstras and the the um... Jackos, did they figure as well? That came later. That's that's the seventies. I'm talking about the you know the the late sixties into the early seventies. But of course, as 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 my skills improved, I was reaching out for more in, you know more interesting and more made, perhaps more complicated music. And and then in the seventies rolled around, and then then there was a you know an, an embarrassment of riches in the in the American bass world. Um, and, but you uh, you were you were you know working and recording at a pretty high level through that period of through the sort of American fusion period. Well, you, I was fortunate enough to to meet Herman. Um, but um, yeah, I, actually, one of the things that I that happened. Let me go back for a second uh, because when I was playing with John Kell, I in in 1976. Now we're talking about. Um, I remember going to norway to play a show with him 
And the opening act was an, er an iteration of Soft Machine that had Percy Jones on bass. It was a very short-lived thing that yeah. he did. With and that's when I first met Percy in 1976. And of course, you know, watching him play the fretless bass, and this was this was right after I, I had, was not not far after that I discovered Jocko. And then watching him play uh, electric fretless bass, the way he played it, which I still believe to this day is completely, every every fretless bass player in the world that came after Jocko was somewhat influenced by Jocko. Everyone, except Percy. Percy has his own way of playing that instrument. It's unique and it's, brilliant and it's virtuosic and still to this day remains you know one of my all-time favorite players he's an underrated, find... underrated player percy jones oh yeah and i and, and he's a friend of mine now he lives in new york you know um you know he's very he's playing a lot these days which is interesting but you know he's always been a very kind of quiet sort of introverted kind of guy but um i just find it fascinating that post jocko i mean i know that they're Jocko and Percy are contemporaries, basically. And completely uninfluenced by each other, which I, fi I find actually almost miraculous. That's a really interesting point, which I haven't thought of. Yeah. Yeah, because, um, it, I mean, I've got a fretless bass. Yeah. And if I pick if I pick up that bass, the sound that I, the only sound I can conceive is Jocko because it's so all encompassing and absolutely and it's and it's and, it, and jacko sounds a very specific sort of singing you know that sort yeah, of sonorous right. whereas you know, you know, guys like going... you know contemporary guys like pino paladino have made their own their, their own voice have their own voice on it but you know you, still you, i mean the jacko thing is there you know it's in the dna now it's mm. in the air yeah. it's in the air. and percy completely not you know his thing is completely his own and i find that kind of genius i i know i'm i'm friends with um uh, and i've worked with him a hell of a lot it's a, a bass player called steve lawson who plays six string, oh sure yeah six string fretless bass i know he's worked to not sound he doesn't sound like jacko he's got especially his chordal playing he's got yeah yeah, yeah but you, you have to you have to work against it though. <laughs> you, you, have to work, you have to work against it you have to kind of like you know be ingenious and figure your own way into the instrument you know that's and uh, you know there are a couple of players that have, and it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. What was so, it like in John Cale's band? Because I found him a very interesting musician, and he crops up in all sorts of different places. You know, he he was reached recently mentioned on the Andy Summers interview. You know, he actually came in and tried to produce the Police at one point. I know he did. They actually, I, I um um I I met all the Police guys um on Mass. Uh, in 2007, when they when they went out and did their um, their sort of police reunion tour, and uh, and they told me that story. They said he actually came in to try to produce them, and they were they were not they, they didn't get along. Uh, no, creative. Well, he's so. he's he's. I mean, Velvet Underground is such a, a such a in, interesting bunch of players, you know, and and. And and I I believe John Cale's background was classical music. He's a he's a violin player. He's a he's a he's a monster musician, isn't he? He's he studied legitimate, leg, very legitimate classical music. His 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 string instrument on uh, his bowed instrument is a viola. Oh, is and, it? Uh, yeah, and he studied at Tanglewood, um, which is a um, very revered, uh, creative concert hall and and and, and uh, study center in the Berkshire Mountains. Uh, I think it was started by Aaron Copeland or something. It was a very, very prestigious. And um, he, he's been through that. And I think um, somehow or other, he got, uh, you know, seduced by rock and roll. And, you know, he met Lou Reed. I mean, he's from Wales, John. And he, you know, lived, moved to New York, met Lou Reed. And, uh, and they, they did something that hitherto has uh, had not been done before which is you know it's kind of taking you know rock and roll and and making it a like a ve uh, a vehicle for their 
uh, their observations and 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 poetry about some of the the darker sides and curious sides of humanity. And Suzanne told me just the other day. Suzanne Vega said that what she learned from Lou Reed when when she first discovered Lou Reed was that, and she hadn't thought of this before, was that you could literally write a song about anything. You know, you didn't have to restrict your 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 verbiage or your your rhyme structure or your subject matter to any one thing, you know, and for Lou Reed to be writing songs about, you know, blowjobs and transvestites and heroin and whatever was like a revelation at the time because rock and roll was, you know, kind of uh, um, more of a lighthearted in, endeavor at, the, at at that period. And of course, Lou Reed, he he his background was sort of a Tim Pan Alley. He's a serious songwriter that could write songs you know and it's a, so that i think velvet underground is a really interesting band john kyle's a fascinating musician and he crops up doesn't matter what style of music you're looking into he will crop up but you know avant-garde electronic punk right you know, art he music produced, prog he, he produced a squeeze album i think one of their one of their albums with with some hit songs on it and in his 80s now he's still making records and he's still popping up well, one one of my best friends is a drummer called Alex Thomas that I've known for well over twenty years, and he's done all sorts of stuff. But his current gig is with John Cale, so he's he's out yeah. coming, yeah. you know. So I will message Alex and tell him, see yeah. if John will check out this interview, you know. So uh, for sure. So are that you was in uh, contact with John Cale. Oh no, I haven't. No, we we actually didn't end uh, at that point in time. We didn't end on a, a very in a very happy place. Um, but well, it's know, very hard in bands not to, isn't it? What's that? Sorry, it's very hard in bands not to. However much you love the guys, it's like being on a bus in the same place with these people. Well, he <laughs> was he was in a very dark place at that point in time, and he was very in you know, it was very uh, he had he had um lost his record deal with Island Records, he had done a few solo albums with Island, and he had you know, with with Brian Eno and mm -hmm. and uh, Phil Manzanaro and those guys. Um, and um, so he was without a record deal, trying to sort of rebuild his thing. And he hired a bunch of American musicians, but I was one of them. And his his hardcore audience didn't really like us because we weren't the British, you know, um, elite British avant rockers that he yeah. usually plays with. And and he was um, doing a lot of drugs at the time. And he just kind of was he was in a darker place. And. It wasn't fun. A lot of it wasn't fun, but it was very, very important to me to have that those experiences because they. So that so, so John Cale was your first, you know, proper, you know, big yeah. name gig, and did right. that, what work did that lead on to? So we're talking mid seventies. That is that right? I was seventy six and seventy seven, and then right after that, I came home, and I started my um a band with some. Uh, people, very, very high-end musicians, you know, it's like, let's start a band and see if we get a record deal. And we actually did. <laughs> so it was a band called, and it was, it was a sort of a proggy, rocky band that was based on some of the American things at the time, like Sticks and Kansas. And it was a band called Spy. And we actually got signed to a record deal. We made one record. It bombed like hundreds of thousands of other records that just came, came and went. And uh, that, so that, that was a big thing in the States, 76, 77, is they started signing up these sort of halfway between prog and fusion bands. Like I could yeah. think of Automatic Man with Mike Shreve, that yeah. was one of those. And then bands like Journey and Toto, they all, they those are the bands that sort of come out. Yeah. You know. We were kind of like a fusion of those bands. I mean, it's crossed between, you know, I would say, Sticks, Toto, Kansas. We even had a, a violin player like Kansas and, you know, it was all that. But um, that was great. You know, I got to write songs that were recorded on that record. And, um, you know, we did a bunch of gigs, but, you know, it just... What was the name of the album? Was it was it self-titled? Spy, yeah. Spy, because you do know my viewers. They will know it. Yeah. In They're fact, I had a few... <laughs> Maybe three or four, not maybe five years ago, I got contact. Interestingly enough, I got contacted by a a British rock fan that was really into American music of that period. 
and said that they had discovered the record and they really liked it and they wanted to talk to, you know, they were trying to find somebody from the band and he found me. And of course I talked about Spy f for a while with them. I don't know whatever happened to it, but you know, it's, it is what it is. It, it came out in 79 and the whole thing was over by 1980. And of course, around this period, as covered in the uh, video that uh, we did earlier, you did the Herman Sabel album. Yeah, that's right. Which I think is a is is one of the most incredible. I don't even know what to call it. Is it a prog album? Is it a fusion album? Is it avant garde? But I know, right? I I don't even know what to call it either. I mean, it's kind of its own animal that borrows from prog, from jazz, from like postmodern classical. I mean, it's just a it's a, a a veritable fusion of of a bunch of kind of virtuosic sources. You know. So I, so I I discovered only I mean I, it's it's still only a few months ago I discovered this album. A lot of my uh, viewers had mentioned this album, so I went and checked it out, and I thought well, I'll have to find out about this. And I started to research into the story, which eventually brought me to to message you that can you just because we've done a whole video on this, and I'm sure a lot yeah. of my viewers because anybody that's come through the Suzanne Vega route to watch this, you know, um, then, you know, can you just tell the story of Herman? Oh, you want the whole story now? Yeah, not, not, not yeah, yeah, may as well. I'm, 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 this, this one's going to be a longer interview than the other oh, one. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, so, um, Herman Zobel, um, a, an acoustic piano virtuoso who came over from Vienna, Austria, at the age of 17 to find his fame and fortune in the New York music world of the mid seventies, which like you already um, alluded to was, um, was, was very, very prominent with a lot of jazz fusion bands, Return to Forever, um, Ma Vishnu Orchestra, Weather Report, and Larry Coriel. So, uh, um, so all these bands were, um, were making a big noise back then. And, so Herman was fascinated with all that, and he figured that New York would be the place to to go find find his way. So the first thing he does when he comes to New York is he walks into a recording session, crashes a recording session at the Hit Factory, which is a famous recording studio, and he walks in, and it happened to be a Roberta Flack recording session. He comes in brazenly announcing that he's the best piano player that in, that anyone has ever heard. And of course, you know, with 17 year old kid with a German accent, you know, walking in saying that is, uh, I think it uh, pricked their ears up. So, um, so uh, they were, they were cool enough to go, Oh really? And, you know, sit down at the Steinway here and play us or something. And he started playing and it like blew their minds because uh you know it was so unique and and virtuosic and um the bass player at that session happened to be one of my heroes my my all-time heroes perhaps my all-time hero bass player mr anthony jackson who played on hundreds and hundreds of one of the greatest bass players of all time incredible recordings with incredible people you know, from everything from, you know, Chaka Khan, Al Damiola, you know, lots of Michelle Camilo, lots of fusion and R&B and uh, just incredible. And so killing uh, it with Hiromi. Hiromi, Hiromi that band he, with him and Simon Phillips and, and Simon Phillips is one of my <laughs> idols, you know. Whoa. Yeah, and, well, unfortunately, as an aside, you know, he had to leave the Hiromi band because he he suffered a couple of strokes. Oh, and he, how is he at the moment? He's... Um, He's okay. He's alive, of course. He's uh, he's in an assisted living situation, and I don't. I actually saw him play about a year ago for the first time, and and he was um, you know, there were moments of his brilliance and sparkle. Um, we'll just have to see if he can make it back. You know, he's not a young man anymore either. Um, but that's an aside. So anyway, um, Herman walks up to. Anthony and and says I'm here I want to start a band I'm here to do my music and you know they were impressed enough with him to give him the time of day and Anthony said well why don't you call um a friend of his drummer and uh and Mike me <laughs> so um 
we start uh, so we got in touch and I I went down and um you know met him and listened to him and you know of course his music was was beyond my skill my skill set at the time but he was so so determined to um to to really make his mark and um the 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 um the the the, the ace up his sleeve was that he was Bill Graham, the famous rock and rock entrepreneur, Fillmore East, Fillmore West, Bill Graham presents. He was Bill Graham's nephew, so Herman's mother is was Bill Graham's sister. So, with you know dropping that name, or I, I, I don't, he didn't drop it a whole lot, but I think Bill, looking out for his nephew, opened some doors for him. Uh, to be able to, you know, get some record company people to listen to him and some management uh, company people. And uh, he rented a loft, a big space in the um, by, near Madison Square Garden and moved, you know, had a grand piano and started rehearsing his music and trying different musicians to, you know, ultimately get to the lineup that he got when he recorded the album. And I was there the whole time. And it became kind of like a, you know, a live in, immerse yourself in Herman Zobel's music, which was the only way I was going to be able to play it. Because, you know, it, it's, you know, when you listen to the record, you could you could see the the depth of it and, and the um, how hard it actually is to play. So by by living there, not living, living there, living there, but I spent many nights there. But um playing the music day after day after day after day, week after week after week. And, you know, as the, as time went on, I became more fluent with it and different musicians would come by and be extremely fascinated uh, by it. And then ultimately... And, and was this a little bit like going to music college? I mean, is that the moment? Is, is that, you know, with Herman's album, did it push your chops up? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, mean, I could never do it again. The only way to do it was to completely immerse yourself in it for months and months at a time and and practice it and, and play it over because, and over. Because this is the thing with music students, you know, I, I've said this all my life, is that it's often that something from outside you comes along yeah. which actually pushes you to the next level. It's really hard to self-motivate it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and we, even if you can, well, I'm going to practice eight hours a day, it's not the same as somebody going, can you play this? And you go, well, no. And yeah. then it's great. It was also a time and place because fortunately I was young, excuse me, young enough to not have, um, you know, lots of adult responsibilities. It was also the mid seventies where, you know, the, uh, uh, the artistic scene and um, the freedom of musical expression was the best it ever was in the world in New York. So um, there was, you know, it was all, it was everywhere, you know, music and the, the musical loft scene, which is a whole other thing with, you know, you had mentioned Ornette Coleman before he had his own loft, Sam Rivers had his own loft, <clears throat> Carl Berger, all these people had places, <clears throat> um, um, Carla Blay, um, they had um, places where they could rehearse and, and it was, it was freeing and the rents weren't prohibitive and, you know, you can go and hang out and they would have a little rent parties where, you know, if you contribute five dollars, you can go see um, Sam Rivers and Dave Holland play for three hours, you know, from, you know, bring your own wine, you know, whatever. It was very chill, extremely creative and beautiful. And so, you know, Herman drops himself right in the middle of this, which is which is perfect. So it was a time and place. And, um, you know, like I said, we were all young enough to be able to go. This is great music. and you know, I don't have to, uh, you know, pay alimony or, or come up with my with my my children's school school uh, tuition. You know, we we didn't have any of that, so so we were able to immerse ourselves freely into into the scene, and that's how we came up with what we came up with. And and um, I think um, by Bill Graham opening some doors, record company doors, he got. Um, the people at Arista Records uh, interested enough where they actually wanted to make a record, and that's the record that we all well. This is a major, uh, a major label a record major. That comes out. One of the most incredible sort of prog fusion, you know, albums you ever heard, and it bombs, doesn't it? And this this has an effect on Herman, who well, then it bombs. It bombs. Um, 
yeah, it, you're right. You're right. Um, he expected a lot more, um, you know, record company support, and he also expected his rise to fame to be a lot quicker. So, I mean, I think there were reasons that it bombed that that he was partly responsible for because I remember attending a meeting with him and Bill Graham, just the three of us. Um, and, and, you know, he was, um, Herman was telling, you know, Herman was, it, it was a very irascible person and, you know, he could be tempestuous. So Bill was trying to say, listen, you know, just take it easy, you know, we'll build up your career, we'll have you doing the, all the gigs you want, you know, and the, with, the, you know, opening spots for, you know, Ma Vishnu, Weather Report, whoever, we can, we can make that happen, but you got to take it slow. And Herman wouldn't hear it, which was, you know, really shocking to me that he was not taking the advice of, you know, a guy who essentially built the American popular music scene. Well, the, other, um, the other thing is 76, 77, I, I, you know, I, I talked to Narada Michael Walden about this. You know, Narada Michael Walden played the Mavish Nultra, played with Weather Report, he played with Jeff Beck. He comes yep. out, he gets a major deal, does the Garden Love Light with a full orchestra. It's a heavy yep. fusion album. And then he said, 78, the record companies turned around and said, you have a hit record or you we drop you. That's right. Well, Everything he, that's the, there, there's so many acts yep. around about 76, 77 that are incredible, but they they were just that little bit too late. And well, the end. that has all to do one hundred. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's always, there's always, you know, there's always um um variables, you know, with the artists themselves. But I would say that ninety percent of that has to do with the ever increasing greed of record companies, because in the, you know, in the sixties and well, in the, in the sixties when when you know American pop music became a a, a formidable um, revenue stream for corporate companies, record companies, um, they actually didn't quite know. They didn't have strict, hard and fast rules about what to do, and they somehow understood. And certainly, the savvy A and R people that work for these record companies totally understood that an artist needs to grow, and if the artist has talent. Don't expect instant success or immediate success from the first album or maybe the second album. You know, you have to be, you know, for, farsighted enough to go, this this artist is great. By the fourth album, we're going to be gold and platinum, you know. Um, as time progressed and, uh, you know, the suits and bean counters got their, you know, got their calculators going and started um, figuring out more and more ways of of monetizing their investments in a quicker and quicker fashion, they began to have less tolerance for that kind of timeline. So by the late seventies, certainly one hundred percent by the eighties, it was a different world, and it was a it was a world of you know corporations trying to get as much money as they can out of artists. A lot of people that were running companies, running uh, record companies or running A&R, A&R departments were started not even to become, not even being um, um, creative people. You know, it, it could be like a lateral move from some other business that, you know, come in and do the numbers and help us, you know, help us, you know, do an efficiency uh, sweep of our company, you know, how to get more money out of it. So that became the situation where, uh, you know, music became more formulaic because they started to analyze, um, you know, what's the, you know, what what kind of music, uh, what kind of sound, what kind of beat, what kind of uh, beats per minute, where does the chorus is ideally come in to keep the interest of the listeners that they'll like this and maybe buy other uh, other bands that are like this so big you know they started doing their you know their um you know demographics and their you know their um you know their their meetings uh to try to formulize success 
Well, this, this is a fascinating thing, and we moved away from Herman Sabel, but just to cut up, because we have a whole video on this, Herman then sort of, he just basically seems to be have a nervous breakdown and he disappe disappears off the face. That's of right. The earth. Uh, yeah, let me and get back to When that, we did the I'm interview, sorry. we there was a this, this rumour that he may be living in a cave in Jerusalem. He's become almost like a mythic. Uh, he, became, he did become a mythic figure in the cult world of prog music. He became, yeah, and, you know, his mother had to, you know, register with missing person. No one really knew what was happened. No one knew well, where he went, what he was doing. And uh, I certainly hadn't heard anything about him in decades. In decades. Well, the thing is, people, this video <laughs> got two, but there's two, there's two functions of this video, and I'm trying to steer it through. One is to really go into, you know, Mike's incredible career and I want to really explore that idea of going from that 70s creative fusion thing to have you know being making songs being involved in songwriting and that creative pursuit but you do have some news about Herman I have some startling news for anybody that's remotely interested in in Herman um Zobel who I hadn't um I think the last time I spoke to him was in 1977 or 78 somewhere around there 77 sounds more like it it'll very last time i spoke to him until one week ago i know it's crazy and because of the the interview that i did with andy um the previous interview um which got a lot of uh traction around the world someone who knows herman contacted him about the interview herman doesn't use a computer he doesn't know anything about anything tech so he's been you know kind of living in the in the sort of in the primitive world that he decided to live in so somebody gets in touch with him and says well you're not going to believe this but one of your bandmates, in fact, the only surviving bandmate, which is me, um, did an interview talking about you. And here it is. Look at it and check it out. And he looked at it. He saw the interview. He was fascinated and very excited, actually, that people remembered him and remembered this record. And this record had has become sort of a you know, uh, achieve some kind of cult status. So his friend, like I said, Herman doesn't have a computer, doesn't have a phone, doesn't have anything. His friend finds me because the internet is 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 good in that way, good or bad in this way, that you can actually find people. Finds me and reaches out to me and says, "I." And this is the message I literally got. He says, "I am sitting next to Herman Zobel right now." And here's a phone number. Call the number. And this is literally a week ago. And I'm like, what? And I call the number. And there's a voice on the other end. And I said, the first thing I said was, who is this? And the voice said, Herman. And it was the first time I heard his voice since 1977. The same voice. The same voice. I mean, of course, it's an older voice, but the same I, voice. I, I recognize I recognize the qualities in the voice that I remember. Yeah. And and I was I was like shaking, and you know, um, and I was like, Herman. And he wanted, uh, he, I didn't, we talk much about, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of time on the phone, but uh, he was very, very excited about, like, he said to me, does this mean, does this mean our record is like going to be a hit? <laughs> and I was like, I, you know, I don't know about that, but, you know, there was a lot of interest, you know, in, in the music that, you know, you wrote and that we, we did. And it's so wonderful to hear your voice after all this time and uh, and he sounded very calm and he sounded very lucid and and then he told me something even more startling he said i'm moving to new york city and i was like what 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 is going on here am i like dreaming this 
and he said that he was initially going to get a three month um, residence of visa, but he may stay longer. And he said something that that um, I found very exciting. And I don't know what it means. I haven't like you know, I haven't had I haven't seen him. I haven't had a deep heart to heart with him. But he said, I want to hit the ground running. That's what he said. And, and, and uh, um, did he say what he's actually been doing for the last forty odd years? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, no, he didn't. And I'm, I, I'm, I didn't want to kind of open no. that up because I, I imagine some of that's very personal to him. Mm. And you know, if we reestablish our relationship and and get a little bit more intimate in our conversations, I'll, I will probe that. But I just wanted him to be himself and I mean the fact that he wanted to speak to me was revelatory to me and the fact that he mentioned he wanted to move to New York and hit the ground running was revelatory to me now I don't know whether any of this is going to happen you know I don't know um, and I, I don't know what he thinks he's going to encounter if and when he gets here because this is New York in 2023 it's not new york it's all about to be 2024 it's not new york in the mid 70s so um this is all going to be a big mystery and certainly if i hear from him again or if he shows up in new york and calls me i will uh let all of you know and then i will get together with him and uh and see what his actual plans are so this well, is permanent watching this and uh, I hope he does watch it. Uh, all I'd like to say to you is this is the power of your music that has reached through the ether to so many people, you know, and it's uh, it, it it's very esoteric music. It's very deep music. Um, but I think it's reached certain particular people in a very deep way. And I'm one of those people. And it just shows you the power of music, doesn't it, to to be able to do these things and bring people together and and there's a power there and hopefully this isn't the end of the story hopefully something does come out of this i mean the album is out there it's it's released um i i i think i have a vague connection with the the label but you obviously have a connection with the with that the people who have the album now haven't you so if uh yeah, but, um, i mean arista um you know i there is um uh, a man named ken golden who started a company called Laser's Edge, and his his whole uh, business paradigm is finding really interesting music, usually of of prog in, in the prog world, and um, finding um, music that has been abandoned, and uh, making deals with companies to re-release these records on disc with on CDs, which they all these records have never seen a mm. CD. Uh, but now they're starting to. So Ken Golden and his 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 Lasers Edge company is a place to find these esoteric golden uh, nuggets that have been missing from the world. Ken Golden, Lasers Edge, if you are around there, and I think he may be in my circle. I'm not too sure. I've got to find this out. But get get in touch because there's an incredible story here, and I, I would love. I don't know how, but I think this story needs to be told. Everyone I tell is that then George just fits. You know, I've told so many people this story, and it's it just draws them in straight away. And so, um, I think it's a story that needs to be told, and to have that incredible soundtrack behind it, so an incredible thing. So, um, but your life has still got even more incredible <laughs> sort of a twist and turns coming up. So, going into the eighties. Yeah. And the scene changed. How, how did that affect you as a, a working bass player? Well, one thing I did was I abandoned the idea of of um, of doing, uh, you know, my my whole my whole um, focus and direction earlier on was to be in a band, a band that made it a band that had, you know, visibility and viability and made great music. And that's what I wanted to do. By the 80s, I pretty much abandoned that and then I was then I it started to you know sink in into my brain that I needed to increasingly needed to make a living doing what I'm doing and and to be in bands was much much too speculative and try to start bands and you know and all that so I started um I started playing bass for other people and um 
the first um, viable um, gig that I had that lasted for about five years from 83, 84. Um, well, there were two things that happened then. I played with um, Flo and Eddie, who were the singers. Of no way. Oh, yeah. For I didn't years. know that. Yeah. I played with them, and that was fantastic. I loved it. And um, I also, at that, in, 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 intertwined with that, I joined a trio with um, the guitar player Yorma Kaukinen, who was the guitar player from Jefferson Airplane and Hot Tuna. So after the first uh, iteration of Hot Tuna broke up, um, he wanted to put another band together, and I was his bass player for about two years or a year and a half, something like that. So that was between 1980 and 1984. I did those two things. And that was full time, and that took up all my time. But I was making a living as a sideman, which I which was fine by me. Uh, so I, that was happening. And then in nineteen eighty five, I get a phone call to audition for this young upcoming female singer songwriter that just got signed to A and M Records. And was uh, I just made her first album and wanted a tour to promote the album, and that person was Suzanne Vega. So, who, so who played bass on the 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 debut album? Um, oh man, I can't even think of his name. He's not. No. So a, this was like session players, which she signed. Was yeah, how how did that it, happen? It was a guy. Actually, you know, um, the first album was produced by um, by Lenny K. Patty Smith's Lenny Kay and Steve Adabo, um, who is a uh, producer engineer and was actually co-managing Suzanne. And Lenny brought in um, a couple of his guys from you know the downtown scene to play with her. This is before I knew her. So, mm -hmm. um, so that record was done and then I got the gig to uh, promote it. And that's been a relationship that I've had on and off since 1985 and i actually just played a concert with her last night <laughs> so wow. that's how long that's how long this relationship has been going on so, so so you come in you do the tour and then you go back into the studio to make yeah what turns out to be her biggest album and one, of the, biggest album, one, one of the big yeah. albums of the yeah. 1980s with a huge hit record so can you tell me about the making of that album Who was that was unbelievable it? because you know the record company was so startled even even with the success of the first album because they didn't you know this was this was sort of a you know um very against the a very against the mold kind of po poetess singer songwriter um in a, at a time where there weren't really a lot of uh successful uh female or tours singer songwriters you know past past Joni Mitchell and Carly Simon, um, Carol King, um, you know, during the seven, during the seventies, um, you know, into the eighties, there was, there, there weren't a whole lot of, uh, wasn't a whole lot of that going on. So they signed her because they rec once again, they recognize that this person has a lot of talent. We don't really know what to expect from it, but let's make a record, you know, which, you know, doesn't happen anymore, but but they uh, they were very very impressed with the numbers that she did on the first album, so they were very readily renewed to do a second album. And there was a hit on the first album, wasn't there? Which was must have been a surprise to them. My my lane on the walls of, was like, here in the UK. That was where yeah, I mean, she was helped, in the first album, and that helped jump uh you know jump jump start the sales to to a place where they they never imagined it would go to from this little first eponymous record. And uh, was, so, was there a pressure going in to do the second album then? Was um, there a pressure to come up with a hit record? No, no, there was no pressure at all. It was a wonderful creative experience because uh, they were so happy that they made, you know, they made the amount of money that they made on the first. They were like, okay, let's, uh, you know, give her a give her a bigger budget. Give her like a bigger studio. Let's it's just not know, like that anymore. Is it? Give her time. Yeah. Give her time to make a record. And uh, yeah. 
you know, we spent a lot of time rehearsing, you know, getting paid for rehearsals. We spent a lot of time in the studio figuring out how best to record each song kind of had its own way forward. So there was no pressure at all. And that's one of the reasons that it came out so, so well. I think. Can you can you remember the session for Luca and all that? Because I mean, my kids know that song. This is how big that song is, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, that and 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 Tom's Diner. Tom Diner. I want to talk to you about that as well in a minute. Yeah, that's a whole other. That's a whole other world. Of, yeah, of, uh, but tell us about Luca. What do you remember of the session? I think, if I'm remembering correctly, I think that the drummer and I put down our little rhythm section, rhythm track for that song before um, the rest of the guys, the rest and her and Suzanne. And what were you playing to? Um, well, we weren't playing to a click that we were just playing. I, you know, that was before, before that. Was there um, guide vocal there or scratch guitar? Uh, there might have been, yeah, there might have been some guides. I, I'm trying to think. I'm not 100% sure. I know we did some of the record like what I'm describing, but I'm pretty sure we did that one. Um, but we came up with, um, you know, our little way of, um, you know, accentuating the groove. And, um, and the thing about it is um, no one expected that. As that song started to take shape and flesh out and the parts were put on and it started to become something sort of much larger than the sum of the parts. And uh, and her manager, to his credit, was kind of the only guy, only person in the room that said, this is this could be a big hit. This could be a big hit. And and we're like, that's um, that's great. Suzanne never imagined it in her wildest dreams because the subject matter of the yeah. Lyrics, yeah all that stuff so like no like this is not gonna be a big hit you know what is it i mean it's like a, you know it's it's not easy listening I but mean, you but you could tell there was a magic going on there though is there that... was definitely something happening and yeah and, uh, and then it hit you know it hit the streets and boom it became a huge hit all around the world it became it was number three in america for that year got grammy nominated for best song and and she you know she got fans from all over the music industry prince became a huge fan wrote her a, a really nice personal letter about that record that song so um yeah it became a became a giant thing and that's when that's when her career exploded and that's when we started um the the highest point of 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 our of our touring of my touring career uh because we were touring in you know as more more luxurious circumstances that i had ever encountered before you know with multiple buses multiple trucks you know beautiful hotels um catering traveling with us um wardrobe traveling with us you know we were playing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger places and uh it was great to see the rise because it's that's that's you know that's something as a young musician you always dreamed about you know let's like you know let's watch watch the you know, watch our music like become become um, so popular. And uh, it's what, the power of the song, and also the other the the, the 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 one I really remember was Tom's Diner. And now there's two versions of that on the album. Well, on that album, yeah, but there are many many versions of that. But on the album, yeah, I get, I think that um um oh here's something that's that you're going to be very very fascinated with. The invention of the MP3 is inextricably tied to the a cappella version of Tom's Diner because the inventor of the MP3 is a German um, engineer whose name is Karl Heinz Brandenburg. And he was experimenting with compression ratios of sound to be able to transmit it through the internet and maintain fidelity so you you know before any of this was was um you know written in stone and and formulized to the the, the mp3 that we that we all know um 
he was the first one. So he needed a pure sound source to be able to see what the fidelity before yeah. and after the compression rates were. Uh, were. Uh, um, and he used the acapella version of Tom Steiner to develop the MP3. These interviews bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I passed over the Prince bit. I just, pa I just passed over Prince. Oh, Prince and this is man. true. I've actually visited. We actually went and visited his his studio in Germany, and he explained the whole thing to us. That is, that is mad. Yep. And, and and the question is, how? Why did it end up as an acapella? What was the process to put that out as an acapella? It I mean, just... it's the most unlikely hit record. And it also <laughs> opens the door for remixes because that the all the it, it's just as that big you know house music things happening, and they and it has yeah, that right. second life as a hit, hit. You know, I can remember being in Australia that was playing everywhere the the, the house remix version. Yeah, of and there's been a lot of there's been entire albums of just remixes of that. Not with not even you know whose idea even... was it to put it out? Was it Suzanne's idea to put that one out as a? Yeah, because I think she she um, wrote that as an acapella as an acapella um, song. She never accompanied herself on guitar. It kind of just was what it was, and so she was like, "Well, let me just you know put it out there like that." And that did open the door for all of the stuff we're talking about, you know, development of the MP3 all these remixes all over the world incredible and those those two songs that just it what's incredible to me is luca i mm -hmm. i I've, I've spoken to so many people have had hit records and i've tried to um try and boil down what makes a hit record mm -hmm. right um and i really believe that the difference between it a hit record and it's nothing to do with all the stuff we want it to be about the music and the playing and i got that you know flat seven on that you know it's, it's nothing to do with that it's the story and it's how the musicians back up the story if you back and your, your job is just to back the story up and i think luca tells such an incredible story and that's why it was a hit record because I, I i put it on again and as soon as it's on you get drawn into a. It's like Jody Mitchell could do this. Jody Mitchell could tell you a huge story in two or two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. She could she could describe someone from childhood to adulthood and all the psychological things that happened in mm -hmm. two minutes, and, and and that's what Luke is like. Whereas right. Tom Diner is is almost like an existential snapshot. Is it's the opposite. It tells the story of a moment, an instant. Yeah. I, Suzanne Vega, she's a hell of a songwriter. <laughs> You know? yeah. Well, I mean, it goes from like, uh, you know, like a, a song like Luca, which is, you know, a very, very, you know, personal story as, as to the extent that it affects you emotionally, because it, uh, it interestingly, it's a it's a universal issue. We mm. all know that, but it affects you personally because it's such a human and emotional story, um, as opposed to the the extremely interesting observational point of view that that Tom Steiner has because it's just you know basically her sitting there observing different things and just stating it as it as it occurs which is also to me extremely interesting and obviously extremely interesting to millions of other people <laughs> this is where all my difficult questions come that's the problem here is I'm going to ask you some difficult questions so firstly what have you learned about staying out the way there's one thing playing all those notes with Herman Zabel and trying to jump through those hoops but you've had a huge experience of playing with a a, a, a great songwriter what have you learned that you do and what don't you do for musicians who are watching this because for me this is the real artistry of being a musician absolutely um what I've learned um you know I have a lot of ability on my instrument. I have a lot of fluency on my instrument that I've developed over decades and decades. What I've learned the 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 most the most cogent lesson that I can or anything or some any something I could tell any aspiring bass player, since that's my instrument, is that you have to serve the song. But what does everyone says this, but what does that mean? I'll tell you what it is. Because I think people they go, oh, that means you don't play as much. Well, it well it it 
Not necessarily. Really, it means yeah. that you have to be very aware of what you're playing and when you're playing. And you have to be aware of the attitude of what you're playing. The first thing I would say if, if to someone who's who's performing with a singer songwriter, it's different when there's it's different when it, there's not a singer mm -hmm. uh, with lyrics and and, mel and melody like that. Um, the first thing I would say is to look at the lyrics. That's the first thing you do because that will proscribe, I think, the attitude that you have to have coming into a song. Everybody watching this, Mike's just told you gold and and and, and I I I just I asked this question because I did a tour with Kenny Aranoff, who's one of the great yeah. drummers of all time, mm -hmm. and I can remember I was sat having breakfast with him, and I said, Kenny, can you give us some advice for me to get you know doing sessions and stuff? He said, What would you know? What what's your advice? And he said, When you get to the session, ask for the lyrics and read through the lyrics. And I was like, What? I want to know about tuning the drums or do I have to, you know, read the lyrics. And, and he said to me, he said, he said, you're a character actor in a film and you got to know what your part is. That's exactly right. It's, you can't say it better than that. And that will tell you, I mean, if you, if you're a student enough musician and your intuition is, is high enough, which it should be at that point where you're making records, it should be, um, that will give you an entree into how to approach the, the song, how to approach your playing. And there's, there are, there can be places where you can inject your own personality. And I've done that, you know, in, in Luca, you know, in the, in the, um, in the, in the B section of Luca, when I play that little melodic, boo -doo -doo -doo, you know, that was kind of my little hook line. I added a hook line to the song, but it comes, it comes in a place where it makes sense with the song because it's very melodic, it's short, and it doesn't get in the way of the vocal. So you can find your little places to do that, but you know you have to be you have to be a wise and astute player to figure this stuff out. So it's my little my little thing to show. Hey, you know I can play, I can do this, uh, but it's all in service of the the greater whole, which is the song. And I think the lyric will will give you a, a bigger insight in how to approach it, how to get into it. And I'm yeah. sure well, if you if when you go into a session with someone like Susan Vega and you sit down and say, can I have a look at the lyrics? It must be a, a, a wonderful thing for them to have musicians that are interested in the lyrics and what the song's about. Because often oh, yeah. songwriters, they don't think in sort of musician terms of chord progressions and changes and these rhythms and that time signature. They're, 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 they are thinking in a sort of storytelling way. And I think, you know, that that thing, because I, I, after Kenny did it with me, I can remember I did it on the next session. And this songwriter who wasn't work used to working with players at your level, just mm -hmm. bog standard players. When I said, oh, well, what's it about? Can I have a look at the lyrics? You could see them like, oh, oh, thank you so much. I knew it didn't, didn't, didn't matter if I wasn't that good at that point because they knew that I was on their side. Right, <laughs> you know? right. Yeah, that's an important thing to do. And and immediately it establishes you as an ally. Yeah. Also means that, you know, you're going to have um, a little more leeway to possibly inject a little bit more personality of your playing, because that's always something I'd like to do as well. I mean, you know, what makes me sound like me, you know, I like to put my stamp on it in a the smallest of ways you know it's great but the, the thing about great songs is they have parts don't they great songs it's like if you want to sit down and play an acdc song or you're going to play like hotel of california you could you could play the parts that go with that song and that's something you can't just sit there when because a lot of people say oh it's all about playing for the song i said yeah but you can't do nothing yeah you, gotcha, you've gotcha. got to do something which has character and weight and it's the tune you know yeah. and 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 I think Timmy Tim, Timothy Schmidt's bass line on Hotel California is a is a great um, case in point here because um, it's not um, it's not the, the necessarily the first thing that would come into your mind um, listening to that song, uh, but he's able to play something play play an interesting an interesting bass part that. Um, that makes you go, oh, Tim. Tim is a good bass player, but it doesn't distract from the song one bit. 
and that's like the beauty of that kind of thing. Yeah, it's 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 it, you it, as I get older. When I was younger, I was all in, interested in the chops. Yeah, and now I get older, and I listen to say something like Fleetwood Mac rumors, and I'm my jaws hitting the floor that all of them are just coming up with such incredible parts which you don't notice, but when you analyze them, you go, that's really strange. I would never have thought of doing that. And that's a great that's a great band to 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 like explore for that because every one of them did something unusual. All the like Mick Fleetwood's drumming is very unusual. Um 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 uh Tom McVee. Tom McVee's bass yeah. playing uh He's he's an unheralded excellent bass player. Well, I mean that's well, iconic, like, isn't it? Iconic bass line. It's iconic. I mean, and and even the stuff he's playing on, you know, with the ensemble. If you listen to the bass part, it's not only beautifully, you know, um, the time and the tone and his touch are great, but the the notes and the things that he's coming up with are really really clever, really nice. Um, so that's a that's a band where you can have enormous enormous amount of, of, of pop popular success, but with also very well constructed and unusual parts that make it up. Well, it, I, the, the thing I got from Mick Fleetwood was the way he enters a song on drums. Yeah, because we all enter it in a certain place, and Phil Rudd from ACDC, he's another guy that can do this. Yeah. Is yeah. that you think where am I going to come in and well, I, 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 it should come in here, so I'm either going to come in before or after. Because and Mick, I, I, there's something on Tusk where Mick Fleetwood it builds up and he comes in, starts playing, and then he just stops again. Yeah, yeah. And you go, whoa! I, that, and then that accent, oh, I thought, was, well, no, we're not there yet. You know, it's the uh, you start to real. It's the grand gestures. Thing like, like, like. I mean, I, I've list, I've heard him do this more than once. Where, like, like. The, like you'll be playing a verse or a B section and it'll be getting into the chorus. And the obvious thing when you hit the downbeat of the chorus is that, you know, hit a crash symbol or something, right? Yeah, yeah. But we'll play the crash on B2 or something. You know, it's like two, three, four, you know, something like that. You know, it's like these unusual things that that really make it, make a song special. You know, I love it. Uh, the, 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 I, I mean, this is probably me just getting old, but. I, I I do have a problem with modern production methods because I think yes. it's just wiped all this out and everything, you know, oh, we got our verse. There's the verse. Cut the four bars out. We have an eight-bar chorus. Copy that across. And they're, not, they're not interested in personality anymore. Um, whatever the record company business is, which is completely foreign. For a guy that's been involved with this most, you know, for 50-odd years, it, what, what's going on in you know, whatever you can call the record industry or business is completely foreign to me has no resonance or relevance with my sensibilities at all. So, um, and you're right. It has wiped away all the personality and the, you know, all the things that we love about timeless, you know, timeless music, you know, the eccentricities, the little quirks, the personality, the, you know, this not, something's not quite in tune there, but it's wonderful. Or the, you know, the hi hat pedal is squeaking but it sounds fantastic in the track who knows who cares you know it says human beings making music and you know it's always the, the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts you know that's the way to do it yeah i i i i do lament it and for me it's that they have it's hard to explain this from the way i see it they have swapped they, they've lost actually something technologically that was incredible it's not an it's not an advance in technology, because the recording studio with real musicians you can you can make a song in the time it takes to play that song, right? And now records are taking months to make as people send the track to someone else and they download it and they put their part down, which is ninety takes, and they chop it all, then they send it to the next person, right? And I and I said to I said to one of my students that there's a big recording studio here in the UK called Rockfield. It's where Queen did Bohemian Rhapsody, Rush did um, Hemispheres, and you know Oasis, Robert Plant, residential studio. And of course, they they they're not getting the work they used to. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah. But it's a very expensive it's a very expensive daily rate. And I said to one of my students, I said, why don't you go to Rockfield? I said it'll cost you, but actually yeah. when you get there, it in that one day, you will be finished. Yeah. Because as, as long as you've rehearsed everything up, you can go in, sit it, it will take as long. If you've rehearsed up, you can play them, record them, you're gonna have like thirty thousand pounds with the microphones of being on hit records, you're gonna have a guy mixing it that's mixed famous records. For, and I, when I said, when you think about it, you're going to spend six months trying to get to a point. And they went and they did it. They they came out that this was incredible. I was sat, standing in the same spot as Freddie Mercury. And all, all that's there. You could still do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the audience don't know. So so why don't why don't why doesn't somebody just take a risk and get a good songwriter and put them in a studio with a band and get them all to play at the same time and get the good musicians? Because in the end, it's no more expensive they, they, they're not saving anything because I, I i really feel that if if you could get a song out like luca now i think it would be a hit record that's interesting i do i think if if because it's it's if you have the video and you it, it tells a story and if because it still happens that's what how the internet works you know and I think we we we've lost out a little bit. Everyone said, "Oh, it's got to be like twenty seconds long, and you've got five second attention span, and it's all TikTok and all that type of stuff." <laughs> it's it's only that because they choose to do it. Everything in this industry has happened because somebody that was an iconoclast and came along and said, "No, we do it like this." Okay. Everything, and I just, I just, I think it's the, I think it's the, it's the industry. Yeah, it it just like you said. I think that period where it got so fat and bean countery. When the download thing happened, they were quick enough to move on it. Yeah, even uh, hearkening back to the uh, the MP3 thing that I mentioned earlier, um, Mr. Brandenburg, when he finally got his compression rate um, right, where the fidelity going in was was comparable to, to comparable enough to the fidelity coming out, um, he went to record companies. Imagine this. He went to rec major record companies. He said, I've developed a technology that was going to make it um, easy to to digit digitize, digitally transmit music through a computer. And, and uh, this is going to change the whole face of music. And they were like, every one of them was like, that's not going to happen. Are you out of your mind? What is and this? that there? You've just explained the very moment when the music industry died. Yeah. That's the you know that's the but I mean the film industry is still you know banging out stuff and you got Netflix and it's all there and people are paying a subscription and all that type of stuff um, and and filmmakers can get a good payoff by making a film and getting it onto Netflix. Get it. Us, oh, you can stick it on Spotify. You know, but unless you're doing like 30 million <laughs> listens, um, you know. Yeah. And plus, you know, you know, you have uh, an entire worldwide culture of younger people discovering digit digitized, you, m mostly MP3s, which is, you know, uh, which is inferior to even a WAV file um, and not even forget about analog. And um, they're listening to MP3s through like, speakers the size of like a p <laughs> you know it's it's the whole experience of music has become like a, a, a wild something that's you know that is 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 foreign to my aesthetics you know everything about it is kind of at this point i, I got i got hold of a turntable about uh, six months ago and I set it up in my studio and I pulled my old records out and I put them on. And the first thing is they sounded thin because I'm, I've got a big studio with the big speakers and it's all digital. And then suddenly it, it was like my ears kicked back in to the vinyl, to the analog. And I suddenly find myself being drawn back into music. I, I really believe there's something with digital that doesn't quite draw you in like analog. I, 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 I don't know what it is. I, I know David Byrne, in his book, How Music Work, talked about this. That you know, digital is very high quality, but there's a because it's that sort of chopped up sound, yeah. Yeah. It, we don't accept it in quite the same way. Because I suddenly found myself pulling out old records, and I was I, I've got tons of like, 
um because i used to be a music do dance music and i got all these old albums like shirley bassey albums and things like oh, that yeah. oh, and yeah. i stuck those on but what are they saying and I, again the beautiful sound yeah. you know um, you, you, you want to hear something great is like get a get a very good copy of uh, michael jackson off the wall oh put, yes and put that on i've got it it is a wonderful experience to listen to that or this songbook stuff by Ella Fitzgerald. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Nine fifties recorded oh, yeah. live. Nelson Riddle Orchestra. Ella on a mic. All done in one take. How right. the hell they recorded that? It sounds incredible. Yep. Kind yep. of blue. Miles Davis. Nine fifty nine. Sounds incredible. Other one. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. It's this has been a wonderful conversation. We've covered so much ground. I when you do YouTube, you see, right? What you have to do is you do the interview, and then you have to find this sort of clickbaity part of the interview, and you put that in the title, you know. And, and so this one, I haven't got a clue which to, what to go for. Do I go for how you're right, a hit record playing with Suzanne Vega, developing the MP3, finding Herman Sabell? <laughs> don't know which one to go for you know um meet the like police hyphen, hyphen, hyphenate them all you, you you have had an incredible career and you must be very proud and, and i'm very proud to know you and and to have a be able to you know I, I, i'm blessed to be able to talk to musicians like this because i i absolutely love music it's been my whole life it's been your life and it's a wonderful thing about to sit down and talk like this absolutely incredible very much uh, I, you don't get to meet guys like you every day so i'm uh i'm very happy to be talking about this and no it, it, it's it's an incredible thing that's um you know now i'm doing quite a lot of these interviews and talking to people all over the world all different backgrounds but the music brings us together and i i i feel like i wish all these people around me i want them to be my friends they think you know because um, all us musicians sit and talk like this, don't they? You know, as soon as you get on the tour bus, you start talking about music and certain things come up. And, um, uh, you know, I, I I just went out to see my mate Kevin Galvin, who's been my mentor. And we ended up talking about James Blood Olmer, you know. Wow. Yeah. And uh, because I did the interview with, yesterday with Calvin Weston. And, that, and, and, and who else have I got to talk to about James Blood Olmer? <laughs> See, this is the kind of thing I used to do throughout my 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 youth. I mean, you know, you always found you found like minded friends, and and you would just pontificate about this stuff for endlessly, and like, and, 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 but the whole landscape of of this kind of thing has changed because you know as you get older and people kind of drift away or whatever it might be, and plus I think the 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 pressures of like trying to get the next gig and try to pay your rent and you know people don't have the time the, the the leisure to sit around for three hours and talk about something no like it's, it's it's a it's I, yeah i think that's what i'm doing here on the channel i think it's it's so many musicians know about this sort of chat and they enjoy it and more and more i'm trying to just have a chat about music and the thing is because you are a great player I know that you know James Buddle, but I know that you know Ella Fitzgerald or Annette Coleman or John Cale or Velvet Underground, Lou Reed. The this is the esoteric heart of music, and we 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 have to hold on to it. And I really believe it 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 it's the it's the thing that will that will keep going. If Herman's if Herman's music can reach forty five years later and do this, then I'm sure that this this sort of period of the music that we grew up in that was so important to us i'm sure it will survive and move forward and i think it will become a sort of minority interest but it will still be there uh, hope, hopefully the labels will eventually move away from it so much we can just get back on with doing because because suzanne's able to go out and tour still she's still able to do great gigs did she still making albums or once in a while not not very often because she doesn't have a label anymore. So um, really, oh yeah, there's a lot of people. There are a lot of people like that in the in the world, which is unconscionable to me. But the, um, the, the industry needs to realize what's going on, and I think a lot of the artists, the older artists, they don't really understand how the internet works either. Uh, uh, Daryl Hall's genius. That Daryl's house. Daryl's house is great. Brilliant, and I, I think musicians, you know. The older sort of legacy artists have got to 
they, they need some advice about how to now relaunch themselves you know on on the internet because actually what we're doing here this this is now part of the industry you know conversations like this there's a market for and the people who are watching this interview will go and check you out they'll go and check out the albums you're on you know and this is what happened with Herman Sabel. you know we spoke about it it's such an interesting story but uh, uh I, I don't feel like the older musicians you know and I'm, I'm talking to some of the real jazz fusion legends and it's almost like they're trying to hold their album back they don't want people to hear it and they're scared it's going to get pirated or something you know and and they're I know I know where they're coming from, but you feel like I'm, it's not like that anymore, you know. So um it's 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 much more about I think fans will support the artist. They will show them love by financially supporting the artist. So I think that's the difference as opposed well, that's to a perfect thing that you're doing because you know it becomes a it becomes much more of a personal relationship. Oh well it all I think it always was in the end, but but it needs to be it well it always was but it's been more uh you know diminished as time goes on yeah you know to to get to like i mean i'm i'm like i'm like no big star but to you know with, with people like um you know that are big fans of certain players or whatever to just to get to know them a little bit and hear that hear them personally it gives you a whole different perspective of, on on who they are and what they do and i think that's a that's a that's a wonderful thing because there's a, there's a spirit that they're communicating with great musicians, you know, there, there's a spirit. And then the internet comes along and I find myself like, yes, I was watching interviews with Ornette Coleman because what he's got to say is, is, is incredible as his music. Mm -hmm. And there's have that. You, uh, have you interviewed Donardo or uh, Jamaladeen? No, but I'm, I'm going to have a chat with Calvin. I'd love to interview Donardo. There's so many people on my list. At the back, you know, so many people, and I'm trying to get good at the interviews so that, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I did, um, a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed Billy Cobham, and that was, I was sat in this chair waiting to, for him to come into the Zoom, and I was like, because he's, you know, yeah, talk yeah. about an icon, yeah, love him. Anyway, thanks for doing that, Mike. Brilliant, I really enjoyed it. It's gone on for way too long, we were like an hour and a half. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I, knew, I knew it was going to go for that so uh thanks you say so you want to say bye bye to everybody and if herman if you're watching bye bye herman yeah keep up the good work andy and 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 uh, happy new year to you and all of your listeners thank you